some disassembly required and that just fell apart right oh hi guys um we are just setting up at the moment we are as you see in a different location because we had my friend owens who is also part of the original team he's worked professionally in kitchener let him introduce himself in a moment but we're doing slightly advanced open fire and barbecue cookery stuff at this point and as you can already see there's advanced kit here and Owen has specialized in this over the last few years so that's why I thought we'd let's involve the man who knows what he's doing. What are you doing Owen? Just uh, getting the fires ready and getting up to temperature for uh, what we're uh, what we're about to do using a uh, Lithuanian shashlikine, which is the shashlik style uh, grill box that would be used in the eastern eastern part of Europe, and then a uh, Japanese style kamado, uh, which is very popular in the world these days. Are both of those properly medieval? Apologies. Are both of those properly medieval? No, none of uh, them are. Well. I mean, no. the, 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 bar, the shashlik box is, they wouldn't have done that, at least not as far as I'm aware, but um, we're using it for spit roasting, which, yes, that's one of the things I wanted to be able to do today because the recipe says use the spit because in a medieval kitchen you would use, be using the spit a lot. Um, so... Owen and I, when we prepared this, I had originally had the idea of using the shashlik box and using two skewers to flip the roulades over. I said, no, I have a rotisserie, so brilliant. We're going to do that. Let's see how it goes. When you say preparing this, what is this? Say again? When you say preparing this, what is this? This. We are making a full meal for ourselves today. We are making Martino's roulades with herbs and good spices and a bit of lard to keep them moist. Um, we're making for dessert um, a custard and we're making a recipe that's originally for, originally for broccoli but we're using a medieval ca cabbage that Owen happens to have growing in his garden and seems to be rubbing off on him um, and some rice and actually we're also making finally using the gold of amber sauce we made in a previous episode who would have, who would have eaten this back in the day what who would, who would have made it who would have eaten it Again, this is from Martino's cookbook. Martino was a cook to cardinals and popes. So, as I mean, the only food we have from the Middle Ages is the absolute top, because that was the only thing that they wrote down. We have the first cookbook that is not um, just for the pure nobility, for the high nobility, it is Le Ménager de Paris from the late 14th, early 15th century. And that is, interestingly enough, a cop fundamentally a copy of a cookbook that is about 100 years older by Taillemont. And even he probably only published it, and it seems to be even older. Um, which, again, was the, the cuisine of the kings. And that made it down. I mean, The Good Man of Paris, Le Ménager de Paris, um, is a book that is for the low nobility and rich citizenry of Paris. But again, it's royal cookery that trickled down to the more common folk. And so we're relying on archaeologists really to tell us what ordinary people would have eaten, are we? <laughs> well, the problem is that doesn't give us recipes. That only gives us ingredients. And archaeology, yes, what, what, what do we find? We find? Mostly we find grains. We only very recently fought, found in an Iron Age um, dig the first evidence that people actually seasoned their food, which was a pot with um, mustard seeds in it. Clearly leftovers in a crust. Because yes, we found mustard seeds growing or in, in finds, but that could be for any reason. Only once we had it in cookware, we knew that it, actually used, that it was actually used for seasoning. Before that, all it was was a reasonable assumption. But reconstructing recipes from archeological finds is very, very difficult. Because there's stuff that rots, like herbs. Yeah. Um, that decomposes and it's not really doable. It's a, it's a very tenuous thing. There is um, a book about Stone, Stone Age 
food, but all it's based on is fines, and then everything else is pure conjecture. So they're losing all the sophistication, inevitably? Well, not even that. They, we don't really know what they did with it. I mean, at the end of the day, all we can base these things on is actual written down stuff. Because we will not find a um, petrified um, 15th century beast or a petrified pot of somebody's stew at home or whatever. And also, there's an important thing here. <laughs> Yeah, I may, I, we also didn't exactly use flint and steel to make to make a fire. I don't usually do that either. Yeah, but we would need other kit for that as well, and I've actually never actually done it. Um, but my, my my problem is it's classic conjecture of if they had known it, known it, or if they had had the ability, they would have done it, and that's actually not correct. My favorite example is pockets, right? Pockets. Humanity has had the technology to make pockets as long as we've sewn with needle and thread. That's, at a rough guess, easily 10,000 years, if not longer. When do pockets come in? At the end of the Baroque period. Why? The pocket got invented because everybody was wearing belt pouches. And in order to prevent your belt pouch being nicked, somebody hit on the idea of sewing the belt pouch against the garment. And that was a set that, of course, now you had an outside pocket that was attached. And from there, somebody went, aha, and the pocket was invented. But roughly, easily 10,000 years, we've had the technology and we've had pockets, what, for the last 350 years? Are herbs now as they would have been um, back then? Some are, some aren't. Um, parsley, I'm reasonably sure, hasn't changed. There is... Um, Fruit and veg, you will see if you look at old paintings, were much less meaty. Um, marginal, I actually don't know. One thing about the store-bought stuff is um, herbs in period would have been more flavorful than um, herbs now, unless you grow your own. A um, simple reason for that is that our herbs are fast grown in hydroculture and they don't have all that much flavor. The other thing is true for spices. Our spices now come by either by fast trip or by plane, but mostly by, by fast trip, I, th I think. Which means they are here within a matter of days or weeks max after they're ready for, for shipping, which in some cases can include fermentation and similar things. Um, whereas in period, Herbs and spices would have either come down the Silk Road. The Silk Road takes about two years. Um, or they would have come via the Arab Sea route, which still is about a year, what with sailing the monsoon, a camel caravan from an Arab port, then to Alexandria or another port, and the rest of the way. So our, her our spices are much more fresh and pungent than they would have been in period. Our herbs are the opposite. So, sorry camera, but we are, I actually have to look down at what I'm doing. Yeah, I mean, fundamentally what we're gonna do is, I'm simply gonna use some of your lovely flat leaf parsley. Oh, something smells amazing. Is that your... That's the marjoram. Oh. That is marjoram for you. You seem to have a lot of herbs. Are you cooking for many people, or what's what's the how do you how are you setting your quantities? Poo. Um, yeah, I'm I'm just chopping enough so I know that I have enough. Um, I set my quantities by when I cook, I see it that it is right. It's the classic instruction on some recipes, and make it so that it is right. Or in Martino to or to taste, which is the more modern. Or in Martino, um, as your master desires. Yeah, I mean, good spices. I mean, this not least needs manuscript work, because I can do good spices because I know what Martino uses in other recipes, and that is an indicator. It doesn't always help because 
um, there is at least one recipe where he says, lists all the five spices that he usually uses, um, and then says, and add good spices. I mean, to some extent, that of course means season to taste. What are his big five? Um, if you go off the top of your head. Nutmeg, clove, ginger, cinnamon, pepper. And that means regular black pepper. Um, although today I might use different ones. I mean, I have, he has one recipe where he uses long pepper. Okay. I substitute lard with olive oil. The reason I can do that is that Martino was a Northern Italian. And in Northern Italy, you cook with lard. In Southern Italy, you cook with olive oil. So I can pretend that I am a cook in the court of Naples and go, oh my God, these uncouth Northern barbarians are using um, lard, whereas a proper gentleman, of course, uses olive oil. But in this case, I'm not doing this because this is here to render a bit of fat to not let it dry out during cooking. And I can't really do that with olive oil. Yeah. Okay, this cinnamon flour, which is a, an ingredient that I once needed for a recipe and couldn't find it and later had a conversation with my Lauren about and she said she just figured it was the best cinnamon because flower of something can mean the best of. And then we were on holidays together in Germany in a working class town in an immigrant area and walked as we do, always do, past the spice rack Zimtbüte. and there was Zimtbüte, yeah, yeah cinnamon flower. But I've never, nobody had ever otherwise. See. Smell cinnamon to me. I mean, it's like always, most of the plant tastes the same, smells the same. The alkaloids don't really concentrate in specific, well, concentrate in specific areas. Not happy, Owen? Yeah, I'm, I'm, usual, I'm curious. I don't get a, a lot of cinnamon. Mm. It used to be a bit stronger and it may have dried it out a bit. Possibly dried a bit, yeah. Although it was always closed. But anyway, what I'm definitely going to put in here a bit is brown ginger. Brown ginger, yeah. Is this what you're saying about changing your spices as you go in case anything needs yeah. tweaking? Yeah, I mean, the, at the moment, since good spices um, can mean just about anything, I'm really judging this and estimating as I go. Because that's all I can do, really. It's to taste. It's within a certain bracket of ingredients. Um, I'm pretty sure I'm on clove. Yeah, come here. Yeah, but we can only use it right. No, and also we can't use fresh. Because coming back to the spice road, it's too oh, it's, it wouldn't be fresh. It, it, it wouldn't anyway. be fresh after two years of dry ginger. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, and Martino even says, take some ginger root and smash it. Yes, a whole dry ginger root. Kaboom. Because it's a mistake I saw another song made and I've made myself in the beginning um, that I thought, yeah, I'll just use fresh ginger, it tastes better, yes, but it's not period. We wouldn't have had it. Ginger, by the way, is an interesting plant in that it's been cultivated so long that we don't have a wild variety. What's that mean? I don't understand what you mean by we don't have a... We don't know. We don't have a wild growing plant. We only have the cultivated one. Which is vaguely bizarre, but there you are. So, so, yeah, where would the places where flowers grow and spices? There must be a lot of things like that that are only cultivated, surely, are there? I mean, wild growing onion is called leek because that actually exists wild, and all the other ones were bred from leek. Onion, garlic, the works, they're all bred out of leek. Bit of nutmeg. Oh, another lovely wa 
waft of scent coming my way. <laughs> so. I'm actually going to add a bit of Kubeb. How are you gauging it as you go on? Because obviously you're not tasting it. How are you... What's experience. Your Just experience, yeah. yeah. The only way you can go about this. Now, Kubeb's, which sometimes is sold as medieval tailed pepper. I don't know whether the camera can get this. Um, Kubeb's is a pepper that works, works very, very well with beef. Um, and it's... I've had conversations about how, how you would substitute it. And we're stuck between black pepper and aniseed and black pepper and mint. I must admit a mortar this size really has something going for it. Now, next one, which I might just as well season a bit differently, since we have two and we can. Which is going to be the better one? Don't ask me that now. <laughs> They're both going to be delicious after all, after all I'm making them. This is the lard coming out now. Where did you get that from? Butcher. Just ask for back fat. Lovely Wicklow cattle, is it? I have no idea. Uh, this It'd is Higgins in, in Dublin, so, and yeah, it's pork. For, yeah. Um, These fat tends to be a little bit heavy on the palate, basically. Yes, so it's for this kind price. of thing, you always, I mean, the word lard really denotes pork, otherwise it's tallow. Yeah, yeah. Well, is this lard though, or is it what the British would typically call suet? Well, suet is around kidneys. And it's also from um, split hoof animals. Yeah, but it's, uh, it's okay. But it's, yeah. Is it lard? It's rendered when it's lard, though, normally, right? Um, no, I don't think so, actually. Not, not the way I've seen it used. Well, I have other herbs there. I have coriander. I have. Mm. I'm actually getting to like coriander as time goes on. Yeah, the weird thing is that it seems, that it seems to be a gene that controls. I have it. I have the gene, but uh, as a smoker, uh, many years ago, I couldn't abide. Mm -hmm. But there's a few things my palate appears to have changed and allow nowadays, like blue cheese and coriander. But my palate previously have allowed. Uh, I really could not abide coriander. It has that soapy thing, but now I get more of a citrusy yeah. vibe from it. I can actually, it's quite nice now in the right context. Okay. Strangely, I've mm -hmm. changed. So, this one here, I'm using grains of paradise also known as skinny pepper or malagata pepper. Um, bit cardamomy, really. What plant does that come from? It's, a, it's one of the pepper family, of the big one. It's a peep or something or another. This might be cut, but is that a psychedelic as well? You're the specialist, what do <laughs> I know? <laughs> cut that bit, for certain. <laughs> Change the battery now, lads. <laughs> Pretty sure it is actually, but anyway. Um, no. Okay, here I'm gonna use cinnamon flour, I didn't in the other one. Make. That should just about see me seasoning this. Um, this is a relative of ginger that is less well known. Galangal. Galangal, yeah. Very common in Thai cookery. Mm. As an accompaniment with lemongrass and ginger in a lot of cases. I'm going to ask you for a sniff of it in a minute. Yeah. It has to be, needs to be handled with even more care than ginger does because it's quite perfumey. You made a face, Abu, what do you have to Beautiful. say? Beautiful. I've never smelt it before. It's it is very dangerous. Mm. It's, it's quite close. Delicate though, isn't it? It's just pretty. Yeah, it's nice and stuff. Roses, it, may, it lifts a Thai curry when you use it, certainly. If you don't have it, 
it's not quite the same. Mm. I can imagine. That's difficult got, so. Where did you get it, Bernard? Um, from one of the online spice shops. Not something you're going to get in the shop, then. Depends where you live. In New York City, you probably will. You get it in Tesco's, you get it in the bigger places, but certainly as a fresh root, it's quite uncommon, and it would be possibly seasonal in the likes of an Asian shop, but it's not that commonly freshly available. I think I have some in the freezer inside, but it's not that common to get, because I buy it and freeze it when I can get it. It's also something I do with ginger. Whenever I get a, get ginger, I freeze my ginger. I don't don't leave it fresh, and then when I want it, I use I run it off the box grater. And so I get, freeze the root. Yes, always. And then I get fresh ginger anytime I want it because it tends to go shrilly in the fridge. But uh, perfect when you freeze it and then grate it off the box grater. So I've also put a bit of fennel seed in there, and I'm going to put a bit of long pepper into into this one. Long pepper being my favourite pepper, hence I've used it a lot. It looks like a bit like a pussy willow tail. Yeah, it does actually. Actually, here, have a sniff. Oh, I know it. You gave me for some, but it does. They look, they remind me always of pussy willow tails. Yeah. And the weird thing is that they start off as individual peppercorns that end up growing together. Yeah, it's kind of. Kind of like that smell that comes from the Christmas decorations when they get taken out. <laughs> taken down. <laughs> okay, to me, I always say, I, if I had to, I would substitute long, pe long pepper with um, black pepper and rose water. I'm not a fan of rose water. Not at all. Why not? Don't know how to use it? No, I'm not a fan of rose, of, of generally of floral flavours. I don't get on with no. it. Any floral flavours. Chamomile would be similar. Any flowers, just unless, I mean, I can eat a flower in a salad. We have a lot of them there actually, which is for that purpose. Nasturtium. Well, we have them there actually, mm. yeah, with loads. Yeah. They're all edible flowers we have there in the bed actually. Um, Hmm, how do I do this? In fact, if you're doing a salad later, it'd be nice to take a few of the heads of flowers. But, um, yeah, I just find the floral flavours in food are not my thing. It's like chamomile tea. The Germans always used to try and get me to eat it when I or drink it when I'd have a sick stomach. It's like, no, I don't want to get sicker. <laughs> no, chamomile is for a cold, not for Oh, well, they always put stomach. me on it when I had a bad stomach yeah. as well, for the antiseptic properties. Well, with this, you see the stem is quite thick and hard, so we're cutting this out. And it's already something that needs a fair amount of cooking. It's quite tough. We did that with Mott the other day. I mean, if I cook for an event, I don't use this knife because it's too small. If you need to chop goodly amounts of veg, Very you need a bigger knife. Show me. Um, I will in a moment when I'm done here because when I chop the cavallo. Even the knife, this is a French chef's knife which has a, the ability to roll on a plate. That knife would have less of that ability. And the idea is you chop with a roll. So that's why that's your traditional knife's shape. But you'll see it in a moment anyway. This is your traditional French chef's knife, which has a, a which rolls mm. on the board um, to facilitate your rolling and your, 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 your clean cuts rather than pushing or anything. Plus, you uh, need a steel to keep your knife sharper so that you don't do yourself an injury because you normally do yourself an injury with a, with a blunt knife, not a sharp knife. To explain that, the reason why that is, is that a blunt knife has its own mind where it wants to go and also you need to exert more force. Yeah, it's more the force. Uh, a sharp knife goes through things, whereas when you, as soon as you put weight into it to have to move it through something, you then have the possibility that things snap or not snap, that the, the speed, that things go too fast and cut things that aren't supposed to be cut. Like your finger. Like your finger. Over to, over to you, chef. Now that looks lovely, Owen. It's really nice. I'm putting it fine, Bernard. Um, medium fine. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, <laughs> it was a statement, not a question, yes. Bernard. Hey, it is gone, what it is. We've just gone past uh, the question. Yeah. 
here. Brown Basmati, which is the one I prefer. It's the best rice, the rice I like best. But the reason for using brown rice, Basmati we wouldn't have had. You don't transport something as cheap as rice over something as expensive as the Silk Road. Um, but we in Europe didn't know how to dehusk a grain. When I grew up, I saw all those doc documentaries about Asia and you saw the farmers throw um, the rice in the air with the big forks in order for the wind to blow away the husk. For some reason, we, we in highly developed Europe hadn't figured that out. Even in medieval times? In medieval know. times, nope, not a hope. Um, the Chinese are using rice flails for thousands of years, right? Yeah, no, but flails are threshing, that's one step before. That mm. we did. Right. But once you've threshed, you still have the husk on the grain, which yeah, is what brown okay. rice is. Yeah, 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 okay, um, I'm in the wrong, wrong phase, okay. Yeah. Because, I mean, bow, um, peasant wars, the yeah, flail is the weapon of choice. thrown up, yes, yeah, yes, Exactly, yes, yes. That, that step, that one we didn't have. Um, so, even to get white bread, you'd have to sieve the flour and sieve it again and sieve it again, making the process very expensive, making white flour only accessible to the really, really rich. Because we just hadn't, didn't have one fundamental step of technology. Anyway, let's quickly do this in the kitchen while we're getting the rest going, especially the meat, I think. Um, the ratio for basmati, brown basmati, is about 1.5 liquid to one rice by volume. Okay. Thank you, sir. So I'm just going to put this on the skewers for spit. You may need to turn these as well, Bernard, to get the insides done. Yeah, but I just noticed that. Yeah, but it's what we have today. Would you ever microwave something before you barbecue it? No, generally not. The, only, the microwave is something I very rarely use in my kitchen at all, to be honest. But for rice, I cook rice using it, and that's about the height of it. Right, it's solid. Now we may need to increase the flame on this. It's coming up slowly. We may need to add more, but I'd rather start slowly. Yeah and discover we don't and we need more than big and discover we don't because it's yes. a real pain especially with the spits this is a dairy rig type spit arrangement so it can be uh yeah they're called a spit for a reason they spit a lot basically once the fat starts to drip they spit everywhere so that's that one going now that's uh So, we're up to the point of making dessert and putting this, that in the oven slash Kamado Joe, uh, Kamado Bono, sorry, um, while we are then getting ready to eat the main course. Um, the dessert is Martino's July custard, which he says is best when eaten piping hot and under an elm tree by the harbor. The elm tree is in the other place, sorry, and we haven't got a harbor in reach, but we'll do our best, and it's August and not July. So, what he says is, you make a custard of 20 eggs, half a jug of milk, nobody knows how much half a jug is, and an ounce of parmesan cheese. And, uh, yes, but... If you make a custard with 20 eggs in that, I'd call that scrambled eggs, more or less. Um, so, I'm gonna grate my parmesan, and it's probably too much for what we have, so I'm not gonna, gonna grate all of it. But it does add a little bit of umami, which is nice. I think that's actually good. Um, crack my eggs, which I should, should have put into easier reach. Oops. Trick for cracking eggs that is a shelling. very thin-shelled egg. 
Yeah. Yes, if you try... Try with a spoon, it'll run off the spoon. If you try with an eggshell, it'll attract to it. Okay. Something just... Yeah. The nature. Chefy tricks. I suppose an eggshell is like the stuff that's in them. And they're if they have an affinity for it. I only learned this flat surface thing recently on YouTube. I saw a film with Audrey Hepburn where she's been taught to do the egg cracking with one hand. I've that done that when I was in a hurry. When yeah. I was... Oh. When I was yeah, making, mm, really. yes, for that. When I was making pancakes for hundred people, you do that both handed. Yeah, but it gets a bit messy now. In fairness. Yes, I mean you that. Always end up with bits of eggshell in that. Yeah. But I mean that was, I think, two of us cracking eggs both handed for five minutes or so. <laughs> I forget how many eggs this was, but it was a fair chunk. That was a kitchen I took over because the guy actually running the kitchen was getting laurelled and had better things to do with his life. Now, he, I forget how much sugar he says, he says, but I'll simply pour some in, and I'm gonna talk about brown sugar in a moment. So, first of all, period sugar is sugar cane sugar. The, beet, the sugar beet is a 19th century development. If you could, Line that with butter and breadcrumb, please. As Martina specifies. And of course, he says line it with breadcrumb, but have it buttered beforehand because that's how manuscripts work. Because you start doing, start saying something, and then you mean, oh, then you say, oh, but I forgot to, and since somebody was writing this down, you're not gonna edit this, but it just happens in the order it happened in. Or in, you thought of it. Are we at the period where they knew to clean your hands? No, we're not. No, that's post Semmelweis, not pre Semmelweis. And Semmelweis was when? 19th century. I well, believe. let's ignore their lesser knowledge on this one. Yes, I would say so. Oh, and what do you think? That's enough milk, huh? Don't use all. Yeah, I'll use it all. Okay. And since I love parmesan, I'm simply gonna eat this. This is also what you do with a souffle. It is effectively a souffle, I presume. It's just to stop it sticking. I mean, it rises quite nicely. Whoops, got a bit of breadcrumb on that meat. Sorry about that. Um, that's actually Montino recipe. Would you believe it? I believe it. Right, so let's pour that in. And stick it in the oven. This one doesn't want to be in the movie necessarily. Is that your oven? Yes, that's our oven. And the oven clearly went out. No, it just needs to be pushed a bit. So we're going to use some tin foil for the resting. What would possibly have been used, period? Or was there anything? Did they even I rest meat back no in the day? I have no idea whether they even did that. Okay. 
the whole concept of braising and resting meat. One of the things is um, that fundamentally, period deals with roasts and not small cuts. Um, I've never seen resting mentioned anywhere. On the other hand, you wouldn't because the cookbooks deal with the specialties of a recipe, not with the generic technique. Um, so, I honestly don't know. And it's also, until drop down, has never occurred to me to ask that question to myself or anybody else. I've never seen it mentioned, I've never seen braising mentioned. Because if you do meat, fundamentally, if you do meat, it's not a roast. It's either as a, what's called a sauce. Um, or in a stew. Black the cattle on me raus. Classic example. So the resting doesn't quite come into the period techniques. Okay. I well. see the valid value here, but it's not mentioned. I mean not mentioned can mean that nobody did it. Not mentioned not mentioned can mean that everybody did it. Well, Self-explanatory and understood is the method. Exactly. Yeah. But Gold of amber sauce. The thing is, I used port because I couldn't get grape juice. Right. Um, juice no, 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 it's not red juice. Um, what Martino uses, that he calls sodden wine, is you know the modern ingredient that is concentrated grape juice, which is what you mix with vinegar to make balsamic vinegar. Yes, it's a reduction. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it has an Italian name. And the thing is, and I need to mention this in some episode, because that one goes back all the way to Roman cookery. Antimus has, uh, Picius has that recipe, has that stuff. And um, the translator that I'm using when I'm not using my own translation calls it sodden wine. I actually need to find the Italian name in the manuscript and look up the names in, sorry, and I have to do this. Um, I don't want to squint too much. Um, we'll get the audio, because it's a nice audio. Yeah. And I'll get the um, but I want to see the Latin term, I want to see the term Martino uses, I want to find out the modern word where I might actually ask Luca. I can't find sodden it otherwise. Basically in wine. No, sodden wine is just really, no, sodden wine is just concentrated grape juice and all right, so it's a reduction. It's a reduction. Yeah. You think there's something else out there that you haven't had yet or made yet? I'm and I'm sure that, I mean, the, 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 translate, the problem with the translator of the translation that I've used since I do Martino is the man is a poetry translator. He's done some very good work, but very occasionally he slips up. Um, I will not translate the Italian term. It's an established term.